Right. So let's start the School of Ancient Wisdom Satsang, the, the spiral of wisdom, as we call it, started by Ma Manize many years ago. And why does she call it the spiral yeah, of wisdom? It's because um, it is, uh, you know, everything in life is a cycle. Uh, change is the only, the only constant, and that's represented by the circle, you know, a full cycle of change. But as we grow in our consciousness, we grow. So it is not just a circle, but a spiral. So that is the logic and the logic behind it, the spiral of wisdom. So a very warm welcome to everybody. Namaskara. My name is Ramesh. I'll be your host for today. And uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to uh, I think invite, uh, to um, indicate, uh, um, before we start off, I request Swati to say the school prayer. Sure, sir. Oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O hidden love, embracing all in oneness, may each who feels himself as one with thee know he is also one with every other. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. So this prayer is a theosophical prayer that, that um, indicates that we are all interconnected. We are that you know, little hidden light, that soul, Atma Bindu. So um, uh, I request, uh, we were not able to get the introduction in time uh, for our speaker today. Uh, Anandi Vishwanathan so I can give an introduction. So, so. Yes. So that, the, therefore, Swati will be giving us the introduction today. The program that we're having, the satsang we're having today is Inner Light, Spirituality Knows No Barriers. So Swati, please do give us an intro to Anandi. Sure, sir. Yeah. I feel uh, very happy to introduce one of my friends, Anandi Vishwanathan, who is a co-founder of Kaveri Angadi, an organic retail store dedicated to providing healthy food options and eco-friendly personal and home care products to families. Beyond her business endeavors, she pursues her passion for art through playback theater and performs in national and international shows. For more than 17 years, Anandi has been passionately championing the cause of empowerment of persons with disabilities through volunteer efforts. She served as president of Rotary Bangalore Abilities, the world's first Rotary Club initiated by persons with disabilities, she has been actively practicing pranic healing for over 21 years. Anandi is married to Venkateshwaran CP and is mother to an adorable eight-year-old. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. That was very nice. So, um, um, namaste everyone once again. People are still joining in, but we're going to start off anyway. Um, the, the program today, the satsang today is going to be um, a little unusual in format. Um, so, uh, um, every now and then you might hear a voice just uh, uh, and, and know that uh, Anandi um, has this um, voice reader you know because she knows she's not able to see the screen therefore the voice reader prompts her if anybody joins or if there's any chat text that is visible on the screen so please include that into your space now um I spoke to um, Anandi last night and uh, it was really a lovely talking to her because she's an example, I believe, of a person who is, who is intrinsically, you know, a seeker who's connected with the divine, um, perhaps to start off with. Uh, and But um, she has over the, you know, experience of her life, strengthened that connection with the divine, which really indicates how that can make a difference in one's life. And she has had her challenges in life. Very, what would have, what would be a huge challenges for many of us? Some of us won't even be able to you know, stand up to such challenges. But she has not only stood up to it, but she's overcome it, and she's really thriving. And that is what I hope we'll all be inspired to hear. So, we'll, uh, what we're going to do is um, we, today the satsang is going to end earlier by seven twenty-five. So probably by about seven to seven ten, uh, Anandi um, will stop. Um, uh, the basic sharing and we will start the in interaction. If anybody has any questions in the middle, uh, please do feel free to ping and uh, ask. So we'll start off with um, Anandi first sharing about her um, background and her childhood, her experiences and the um, challenges and how she overcame. Them. So over to Anandi. Yeah, um, thank you, Ramesh. Um, so my name is Anandi Viswanathan. I am a Tamarian. Uh, brought up entirely in Bombay and uh, now I live in Bangalore. Uh, so we have a typical 
uh, Tamil family background where uh, it's always been a, a Tamil speaking home and uh, we have our uh, religious practices and we have our rituals. So that's how we grew up uh, from the childhood being told stories of God and stories of many devotees. Uh, so Mira was my favorite uh, story. So for, for many days, I've gone to sleep listening to Mira's story. And I used to be deeply connected with Krishna. I had a tiny Krishna that I used to keep with me. But that was when I was very young. And uh, so as we grew up and uh, we got exposed to different things. And I, as a teenager, I had a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of inspiration at home. Because my father uh, is a disciple of Swami Chinmayananda. And his elder brother is a disciple of uh, Swami Shivananda. And my mother is a great devotee of Lord Ganesha. So that used to be how it was. We always had reference. Uh, you know, we would always go back to our uh, teachers and uh, our deities. And that's how it was. But as so I while, came... while, you, while you're sharing, uh, Nandi, um, yeah. since I spoke to her last night and I had a, a lovely, uh, you know, um, idea um, about her background. What I'll be doing is now and then I might be asking questions even in the middle of our sharing just to uh, enhance the experience because I, I know a little bit of the background and it might make it a little more, uh, you know, um, interesting for the uh, others to know. Uh, and, and also I must tell you that um, Anandi was brought up in a family where her father was actually working for Indian Airlines as a flight engineer. So it wasn't just a family that was an extremely traditional spiritual, spiritual family. They were very much uh, one foot in the modern era and the other one in the space of divine exploration. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Thank you, Ramesh, yeah, for bringing it up. So, so that's how it was. So we were in Bombay. Uh, so though we were a Tamil, very traditional Tamil family, our, we had our full liberty to explore and ask and seek. We weren't restricted in any way. Uh, so when, when I became a teenager, I, I did a lot of seeking, a lot of searching, a lot of questions. And uh, for a long time, I did not get answers to some of my questions or a large number of my questions. Uh, I But it was like I I wasn't stopped. You know, so I was allowed to seek. And it I though I did not know it at that time, I was still moving in a particular direction and which I realized much later that I was always moving in that direction, which I hadn't, I had no clue about at that time. So the first challenge for me was uh, uh, when I started losing my sight. So I had always had glasses for a long time as a child. I had, I had worn glasses to read, but uh, I did not realize that I was carrying a genetic disease within me uh, that manifested itself when I was in my late teens. So when I started uh, having difficulty seeing many objects around me and when we went, it took a lot of searching because rare diseases are uh, not easily diagnosed. So a lot of doctor visits and multiple different uh, treatments and finally the, 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 the information came that this is this disease called retinitis pigmentosa and uh, this disease causes the cells in the I, you know, we, you know, right, when we have in our body, all the cells, they usually keep cycling. There's a cycle of the cells and new cells are born and then they die and new cells are born again. So the cells in the retina of my eyes, uh, so those cells, when they die, they don't regrow. So they just remain dead. So basically, uh, the, reti the cells in the retina slowly, uh, all of them are uh, degenerated and the, the retina was no longer able to capture the images and transmit to the brain. So that resulted in me losing my sight. So this happened over a period of about three to four years. Uh, it was quite rapid in that sense. Uh, so while I was going through this phase of my life where I was losing my sight, uh, I was I was still very enthusiastic about life. Uh, this energy came from somewhere. At that time, I didn't question from where it was coming. So it was, I, it probably it never occurred to me that I should accept that statement that you, uh, that I was going blind and stay with it. I was always looking for options, you know, what could I do to, uh, basically the idea was to keep up with my peers. Uh, I wanted so, to. So um, 
Yeah. Uh, when you lost your sight around, you were to around 23, isn't it? 23, yeah. And uh, about three, four years, that means you must have been 18 or 19 when they diagnosed you for, with this. Ill. That's right, yeah. Okay. So at that time, the diagnosis wasn't there because diagnosis in rare diseases takes a long time. Right. But they told me that the cells were degenerating, but they didn't find its name at that point. So they, but so the so the doctor's diagnosis was it, this is happening and it might take about twenty years, twenty five years. It looks like slow, but it wasn't slow. It was very rapid. So, uh, so I was all the time like trying to live life, you know, like do what others were doing. So I did all, most of the stuff. Like I would go out and enjoy and hang out with friends. I was a very avid reader. So I always, you know, like at that time I used to consume at least one book in four to five days. Mm -hmm. uh, one big book I'm talking about so so that's how I I was and I did not think my eyes would I mean it would my sight would go so suddenly so I was just trying to do I uh, live as much as possible and uh, so when I was 21 uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and uh, so she was already it was already a grade 2 cancer and that time we didn't uh, the medical facilities I don't know how far it's improved no, 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 no. but uh, the medical facilities weren't, uh, uh, you know, there was no real, you could do chemotherapy, you could do radiation, but uh, sometimes the prognosis wasn't that good, that great. So we we initially thought she would make it, but then uh, her cancer came back. Like it was, uh, so it, there, was, there was a remission and then there wasn't much uh, hope of her survival, but that's only about the survival of her body. The way she lived her life and the way she, uh, the way she modeled us, how, modeled for us as to how someone would live, should live. Okay, that was very interesting because so my mother, uh, she hadn't expected to die when, at that age, you know, when she was in her very early 40s. Um, so she wasn't, I mean, no, nobody, I don't think anybody expects to die at that age. So suddenly when she was diagnosed, okay, she, uh, she would have uh, definitely felt a lot of things within but what she did what she showed us was the brave face so she did not sit and you know seek sympathy or feel sorry for herself so every day it would be fun you know we had so much so much laughter in our house and that's what I remember about her now as how much laughter there was and how much fun and uh, you know the the whole experience of seeing someone going through so much and still laughing about it and uh, so at the same time I was going through sight loss and that was worrying her a lot uh, because she, she also knew that she wouldn't be around to look after me so she uh, she ne though we never spoke about her dying but she would tell me like you know you mustn't let it stop you you must learn to do your own things you must practice if you can't do it you have to think of an alternative way but you can't let this thing defeat you and uh, that stayed with me. So, so when she was struggling, so that's where my my spiritual experiences, or uh, you know, that started accelerating at that point when she was very unwell, and I was looking after her at home. So I had a lot of questions, as I said, as a teenager growing up, I had lots of questions. And uh, so while I was looking after her, I was exposed to one particular teacher. Okay, and I happened to. I kind of hear the discourse, not seriously, but as I was passing through the house, you know, some, some channel would be on, sometimes some spiritual channel would be on and this person would be speaking. And I was interested, it caught my interest because the questions that I had deep within me for which I had no answers, uh, I was getting my answers there. So, so that really caught my attention. And because until then I hadn't thought of uh, spirituality deeply okay for me it was like I would just pray that's all but that changed the way I uh, I I was thinking it brought new perspectives uh, what is also interesting at that point was my father uh, as I told you, you know he he's a devotee of Swami Chinmayananda and uh, he had started practicing pranic healing when we were uh, still in school so it was a known concept for us we knew about pranic healing we had uh, we had also practiced the meditation on twin hearts. Uh, so at that time when my mother was very sick, so my father asked both of us, both both of us, my brother and me. So he said, uh, both of you learn pranic healing because we'll 
at you know we'll be more hands and we can give her more healing if you both learn so that's where we got exposed to pranic healing i you would have heard of the school of pranic healing right it's a uh, it mm, so it's a it's a school which has two aspects one wing is the service wing as we call the pranic healing and other is the spiritual side of it it's called uh, arhatic yoga where they teach us uh, meditations the first one being the meditation on twin hearts and then uh, there are further meditations as we uh, as we practice more and more so this gave me the the strength this meditation this practice uh, so that was uh, my my guru's name is master choa kuksui and uh, 15th of august that is today also happens to be his birthday so that was one of the reasons which i was really thrilled when uh, varshita called me hmm. so, so I, you know uh, just just to um, put in a word here yeah. uh, many of us would know that you know many of us uh, see as seekers we would also experience that synchronicity like you know when you are being called for something right uh, An anandi mentioned that it just so happened that she wasn't very sure that she would talk to today but when she she heard the date it turned out to be a guru's birthday so that is how these subtle signs come and if one is more uh, silent within more of these subtle signs become visible even for example when you let's say uh, you know like in her mother's case and even in my case when i'm uh, asking for a sign or you know asking for some communication from the higher self and suppose you believe in some form let's say uh, hanuman ji or ganesha or what have you and you'll suddenly find um, you know some random place you'll find a, me a message that comes through because you see a hanuman ji with some words there so if you will also look at uh, anandi's uh, family background i i've observed that uh, this uh, seemingly synchronous or you know random hearing a guru's voice on the tv uh, and also mind you she, while she's a tam brahm tamilian brahmin she's not a conventional tamil in brahmin she was she is a seeker because she used to have many questions that were unconventional and um, when she had those questions they were answered in this manner and secondly she was given that freedom to ask these questions it wasn't like you are asking something non traditional and it wasn't like she, her communication was being stopped and moreover her, her entire family had some kind of uh connection with the higher and there were seekers and when we are seekers uh, it is observed in those families that the souls that come into those families are also of a higher level of vibration because uh, that would be conducive to their further growth and all these things seem to tie up in anandi's case as per as per by my observation just to give Something a hint very interesting what you said ramesh actually uh, you know getting those indications and the signs uh, so as i told you like my mother was a great devotee of lord ganesha right so whenever she would set out to do you know whenever she would want some divine indication about something that she was about to do okay she would always pray for his blessings okay and then somewhere she would see something related to ganesha either his photo or his name written somewhere or something okay and there was a very interesting incident where uh, she was going to kerala uh, for some work and uh, she had prayed but uh, she was hadn't seen any picture of it, it, it hadn't come to her and that was occupying her mind you know like she was thinking why you know it hasn't come it hasn't come and while she was the traveling in the train and the train was passing by there was this crossing the road crossing right where the people are waiting to cross and right. there is this truck uh, which is care like transporting an elephant okay and uh, and she was very thrilled you know in fact she she remembered to tell me about it she said you know i was so so conscious like i haven't seen him yet and then he comes like that and you know i when i saw him on the truck i was like wow you know this is this is so beautiful so so yeah so that it just popped up in my mind when you said it yes <laughs> very nice please get please carry on yeah so so yeah so i so i was 23 at that point when i lost my sight uh -huh. uh, and another uh, bottom sorry 23 when i lost my mother uh, to cancer uh -huh. and then another 3 to 4 months i also lost my sight it was now uh, now I, i can imagine for other people that a double whammy like this would be something that uh, some people can simply not get over they probably will go into depression and they might not even be able to survive long you know it's because the mother was for her a pillar of strength but you can see or see that in the family there was a general cheerfulness now that is a key i've observed in many I, 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 
many people who are spiritually inclined that they somehow get into the space of cheerfulness you know to uplift themselves regardless of the situation mm. regardless of how bad uh, you know life hits them uh, i mean we call it bad but it is just an experience actually if you look at it from a spiritual perspective and at the end of the day they bounce out of it in, through their own means it might seem very tough but they bounce out of it that is a key learning for all of us that in our lives no matter what the difficulty is keeping uh, our chin up and being cheerful keeping our heart light using humor or many other techniques is a very useful space to be in and to remember yeah absolutely because i mean everything is an experience in life ultimately yes yeah so so even i took disability as an experience of life because we have many lifetimes and uh, in every lifetime we do experience different things so this is my lifetime to experience this uh, so so that makes it easier for me and uh, it made it easier for me back then but now i'm very very comfortable with not being able to see uh, we'll come to that later i suppose uh, right. so i so that point you know uh, that was a point where uh, my te- i i felt my teacher's grace in my life um because I believe, I mean, I think it is true uh, that our teacher is our permanent parent. So every lifetime we are born uh, different places, but our teacher remains with us and guides us through different lifetimes, through our different experiences. So when there is no hand still, there is the hand of the teacher holding on and guiding. So that was what uh, it, it, it strengthened me. See, I'm not, uh, I can talk of all this in retrospect. It, I wasn't thinking this at that point. But I found that strength somewhere because uh, we were just a family of four. And then with my mother gone, we were just a family of three living very far away from our other relatives. So we had just to rely on each other. And it was a very tough crossing for all of us because it was like losing one part of our body. So we had to again find our center and again find our sink. So here it helped that all of us were by that time pranic healers. We all had uh, you know access to the same guru similar teachings and we were practicing our raw our spiritual practices we were doing it together sometimes group meditations we'd find time in a day when all three of us could do it together and uh, we were also you know if, if required we were healing each other also so as a family we were connecting and uh, though in most families the parents remain parental until the end you know in our case we became more like friends it was my father and my brother and me and we found that balance where we, all of us were like friends we were in an equal place where we could all talk to each other openly freely about life and share our questions debate together discuss together argue fight everything but it was very beautiful and you know that that really struck me when um, Anandi mentioned this to me yesterday as well, that um, this is another key takeaway. You see, the most, probably one of the most luxurious things one can get in a marriage, for example, is their spouse's heart. You know, the, the kind of the heart is the more luxurious the marriage experience is, uh, regardless of your material experiences. So um, in I An- think Anandi's case, uh, though, uh, you know, physically she had... Uh, uh, she lost her sight, which is a huge thing for many. And even, even more importantly, she lost her mother. But, um, and when she mentioned that it was like losing a part of myself, you can understand intrinsically the huge, uh, you know, plus point in the family was that the family was very, very strong, rock solid. The relationships were absolutely rock solid. And that is another uh, takeaway that indicates that if we acknowledge regularly in our own families, uh, we strengthen. So um, this this aspect, not many might see immediately, but it is there and we must pay attention to that aspect as well. Yeah. So so that's how we were and uh, that helped us, all of us, because we were coming through grief and we were also looking at life ahead because one part of our growing up, you know, it, it, it had kind of ended with my mother, but the rest of the life we had to go on. So even my father had to move on. Uh, so we all had that, uh, you know, we were holding on to each other and coming. And uh, so at that point, we were able to, uh, you know, focus on, we, we moved on to focus on careers. My father, we finally my father to retire. As I told you, you know, he was an aircraft engineer. So we had grown up with that kind of conversations at home. 
and uh, I finally it was time for us to bring in our own careers and into our home conversations. So we so we took up different careers. My brother took up uh, networking, a network com computer and uh, computing, and I moved into public relations. So, so this was when so, this was when you could not see. Yeah, I couldn't see. How did the so work environment treat you? Use... I mean, how did they expect accept you as a colleague when you uh, were blind? So, so that's very beautiful about uh, some of the places that I've worked in. Uh, they were, yeah, there were challenges with some people, okay, because uh, you know they they couldn't understand how I would be able to perform. But one place that I went to work in, um, the the CEO, he had a wonderful, very beautiful outlook. And uh, he said, if I look at somebody and I think they have a limitation, that limitation is not in their body, it's in my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so when I joined the company, that's what he told. There was a special meeting he, he organized for us, uh, for, for our Bombay office. And... Uh, he told the whole office that, you know, if you look at her and think she is limited, she has a limitation, it's not in her, it's in you. So it's for you to change your attitude towards her. She doesn't have to do anything. She's already doing everything. So so that attitude uh, actually set the, the, the turn for me in the company. So I was very accepted over there. I had a wonderful experience. Like people would come in and, you know, like it. I was just a part of the gang, you know, I would be part of the office secrets, part of the office gossip, part of everything, you know, the parties, going out, hanging out. Uh, I'd also worked late night. And uh, so I never got, I was never treated as a person with a disability. Okay. And uh, that was what I was, the attitude which I was, I was carrying myself in my heart. Okay. It's because uh, when my father started, uh, you know, he started, started telling me like, now you have a job and you know, you are, you are where you wanted to be maybe it's time for you to start thinking about getting married. Okay. And I so what, about, uh, what about mundane things? Like one, of course, I mean, even if you're, you're, you're blind, your muscular memory would uh, help you walk around the house and do all the daily chores. Right. Right from getting ready to cooking. By the way, cooking, uh, I think, uh, I must tell our satsang family that she cooks uh, without her sight. She knows exactly her kitchen is very organized. She knows exactly what... Where, what is where and she's only burnt herself once so that's quite an achievement Just once. <laughs> i know her wife has burnt herself so many times yeah. um, but she has only burnt herself once so that really is quite an achievement but i'm curious to know how did you manage to con commute to work in, in that one place like bombay so i would take the local train okay um that's one thing that really impressed my husband when i said i'd take the local train in bombay how do you cross the road? How do you? This is a huge crowd that people push. Yeah. Out. So, so the thing is with the uh, for someone who has grown up in Bombay, we know the trick of getting in and getting out of the train, which people from outside don't know, so they struggle more. Uh, so the thing is, and the other thing is, like there is no other way of traveling. You have to take the train. So mm -hmm. I used to have this white cane. You have seen other blind people also using it. So I have a white cane. So I learned how to use it. So there are ways in which you have to, you can use it to understand the road in front of you. Like, you know, whether there are holes or no holes or foot, if there is a, you know, if there's a curb ending or there's a step coming up. So these things, the cane will tell you if there is a pole in the middle, if there are obstacles. How do you cross the road? So I take, I, I take people's help. I, oh. there are things which we don't risk, like, you know, because on the road, we don't know which vehicle is coming and, Sometimes the driver might not notice the cane, so it right. could end in an accident. So there are places where I, I don't have a, any issues in taking help. Like, the, in fact, there's a very beautiful experience I had. Uh, so when I was working in this place, the same place I told you about, no, the inclusive happy place. So I had to travel a long way. It was 50 kilometers from my home. Uh, my office was around 50 kilometers away. So. Wow. In Bombay, that's not a distance because the train takes you for the most of the way. So within within an hour, you probably cover most of the distance. So I had to take a train, get out at a particular station. I had to take a bus from there. I had to cross a road, take a bus. And that bus would take me to another point. And from there, I had to cross another huge junction and then walk for about five to eight minutes to reach my office. So when I would be standing there at the second point where I would get off from the bus, uh, so when I would get, take the train and get off from the train, 
many people would be you know going towards the same place so if i whenever i had to cross the road somebody would just help me across uh, but the place where i had to cross the you know get off the bus and cross a major junction sometimes i would have to wait there because you know people are generally rushing okay mm -hmm. and then regularly this young boy would show up okay and he would always help me to cross the road so oh. so it was very nice of him to do that you know and then i one day i asked him like what do you do then he it turned out like you know he's a boy who stands at the corner and he's cleaning all those buses over there so whenever he would see me he would drop all his work come help me to cross and then go so it looks like the universe has sent you many extraordinarily kind people or maybe the way you are being and the way you are thinking is bringing out the kindness in others probably and i would spend my time in the train you know at a good 45 minutes i would be saying my prayers okay uh if i would be lucky enough to get a seat i would even try to meditate but at least i would say my prayers do my chants you know i would use that time because it's a good 45 minutes time no which otherwise there is no point like what would you do with it so i would use it for my other uh, you know i have to start quite early because it's a long distance mm -hmm. so whatever i prayers and chants i couldn't do at home i would do it in the train mm -hmm. so i think that also influenced a lot of things for me uh bringing in the right people at the right time and showing me the way in many places and also finding a job where you have such an extraordinary person for a boss absolutely yeah absolutely yeah true very true that is a wonderful place i i really enjoyed working there so so that's when then my father was talking about me getting married and uh, so we went about putting it up on bharat matrimonial and uh, so after but then uh, uh, lots of uh, uh trials like you know many people coming up and then when they would realize uh, it that I, you know my blindness so uh, there wasn't much positivity and i did not you know it wasn't going anywhere basically and then i told my father i don't think i'm going to uh, sorry not at this point uh, so when you're looking up you know what kind of partner i would want and i told my father see the, the, the person that i would like to marry okay is someone who who doesn't look at my look at, who looks at me and who doesn't see my disability okay like someone because from within i always felt that i'm full complete whole nothing wrong with me okay? because i had by that time learned to compensate for the loss of my sight i could so it wasn't bothering me so i felt whole and complete so i told my father i don't know how others look at me but this is how i look at myself so the person that i would want to marry is someone who would have a similar outlook you know they wouldn't they it, should, it would be a person who would see me as a full person you know it it wouldn't be a person who would look at me and say okay i want to do charity and marry somebody like that it's not a i, I don't take charity that way so my father was okay with it though he was very skeptical he said probably such people wouldn't be there but he still went ahead and uh, so then we were looking and we didn't find the kind of person that i was looking for i did not find so i was telling my father now to one year we have tried and we haven't found so i am not uh, sure anymore so we we you know maybe we just give it up and then he said no we'll just give one last try and uh, so in that one last try which was for 3 months so uh, that's when i met my husband uh, so his or parents had also been pushing him uh, to get married and he was like putting it off for the longest time and finally he said okay i'll try i'll try now and that's when he put up his profile he saw mine and uh, he called me and uh, then he was just introducing himself and i told him see i begin my introduction by telling me about my telling you about my uh, disability because that's something that you need to know first and then i told him this is what it is and i can't see and the first thing and then the thing that he the reply that he told me was that's on the outside right on the inside you are a whole and a complete person so that doesn't really matter so then i thought yeah this guy is you know this is the password basically this is the divine indication <laughs> yeah so he knows the password so this must be the yeah. right right person and then we spoke for quite some for some time like our first call was about 45 minutes uh and by the end of those 45 minutes uh, we had made up our minds that we were going to go ahead and marry each other and then our families met to discuss everything so i didn't see him we didn't meet each other at all uh, the first time we met was on our, the day of our engagement and uh, the 
then again, I think we must have been only once and then finally the next time we met when we were getting married. And also one more thing is, uh, a husband does have um, a small disability himself. His uh, joints are calcified, so he's not able to flex the joints very well. But still, that does not, um, uh, you know, uh, take away from the largeness of his heart and uh, the sheer uncanniness of this entire experience. Because really, I mean, when, you know, the, the door, Lord shuts a door, he opens a window somewhere. And I've also been re repeatedly and I've experienced it myself that sometimes when things seem just too tough, we must also know that when, uh, no lesson is so tough that it'll crush us. It, that's how it seems to work for everybody. For everybody, it's just tough enough for us to grow in this life. Like if you take the lessons of, say, a, a minister, prime minister or a thing, or a, a business tycoon or a very uh, popular person, it may be much tougher. And it may be so tough that we can't take that kind, that level of say, social uh, scrutiny or what, what have you, you know, or huge scandals and scams. But uh, we have been given lessons that are just tough enough for us to grow. And in this particular case, when the door seemed to shut somewhere, windows of opportunity opened up, you know, as we lived life to the fullest, new opportunities open up magically. So this is an illustration of that. Um, Very imagine. true. Very and true. one more thing is that we have about... Um, uh, now that uh, just to indicate a timeline, it is about uh, nearly seven ten. So just another three four minutes of uh, sharing, and then we'll open it for questions. Okay, cool. Thank you. So that's how I moved to Bangalore, and uh, it was a very new experience for me. But what came with me from Bombay to Bangalore was all this, uh, you know, the blessings, the grace, uh, because the family that I came into also was a very beautiful family. Uh, so my husband is into, uh, he's a devotee of Sadhguru, Isha Foundation. And uh, his parents are also very uh, you know, traditionally devoted. They do their practices. They, they used to do their practices. The whole system of a family prayer room. And and uh, the beautiful thing is, uh, it's not just uh, external for them. It was deeply internal. Because it was not just my husband who was very accepting and open. Uh, they were also equally accepting, equally open. Uh, in all my uh, time that I spent with them as a family, uh, there, there was never, uh, never a discrimination or nothing said about, you know, no, no derogatory remark. I was just accepted and loved. And... Uh, that's uh, that's that's made my life so beautiful because I, you know, the relationships that I've had with my family, even extended family and the family, that, you know, my married family, all of these relations have been very beautiful. Uh, I've been very really blessed that way that I have a happy relationship. Wherever. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And also, um, uh, to add that she has a lovely daughter, an eight-year-old daughter. And uh, she actually uh, is a part of a wonderful Waldorf school community. I don't know if you've heard, uh, heard me talking about my son in a Waldorf school before. So her daughter is a part of this community. And that community is really a very dharmic-based community. And it has inspired her a lot to also be an entrepreneur. Uh, that I think maybe Anandi will elaborate on. Yeah. So yes, so we were... Uh... So we own an organic uh, store, basically, a uh, retail store. Um, the idea when we started out was that we both had, I mean, we had entirely different careers. and uh, But there was a point when we felt uh, that when we used to go around and, you know, when we wanted to buy healthy stuff, organic, non-chemical stuff, uh, we had to go a lot of places, like different places to get different things. And then we thought, you know, what it would be more, you know, it would be very good if we could bring all these things and put it together in our, our place, you know, near our place, where others could also access it. Okay, uh, because we we were seeing that with this healthy food and uh, you know the, all the things that we were doing with healthy things, uh, our life was very healthy. We did not have these common ailments, and we had a better lifestyle and a better uh, productive life and everything. Uh, so we thought like this might be something that we you know it would be very useful for the community. So that's how we started this. It's a store. It's a tiny little store called Kaveri Angadi. It is uh, there we have all groceries and your home stuff and your personal stuff and all kinds of things. 
uh, snacks most you know like all of the snacks of course they are homemade and you know like we we take care of the quality part of it we ensure the quality but uh, we get these things also from our local manufacturers and local farmers uh, we so it, it it's in two ways one thing is that we eat local so it suits our bodies and uh, you know that way it's healthier to eat and it's also like we support the local community so we we create a sustainable uh, economy local economy when we even we go local so that's what we are trying to do with our store so that's our that's about the business right um sorry i had to just plug my computer in so um the time now is 7 30 uh, sorry 7 13 yes so um uh, thank you so much, um, Anandi, for sharing your remarkable life and how you you, um, you know, dealt with it yes, is very inspiring because not only were you not stopped, but you actually went from step to step. But you know what strikes me is I feel you are a very lucky person. <laughs> it might mm -hmm. sound very funny on the outset. But if somebody heard that the, you know she, she became blind, especially when she was born completely with the 2020 vision and she became blind when she was 23 at, at her at the you know um, uh, 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 you know the age when people flourish they're a young uh, adult and they are uh, raring to go out in the world and you suddenly lose your sight it can be a devastation for many people which, which can't, they can't get over and at the, and the worst part of it is such a beautiful family with such strong relationships and bonds to lose your mother at that age is uh, truly, uh, you know, something that um, is extraordinary uh, for a person to be able to overcome that. And she's done it. She makes it sound like a, uh, you know, a cakewalk. But, you know, the, after de dealing such head blows, li uh, life also seems to have, I must say, she's been very fortunate. How many of us can even say that, uh, okay, the address of the shop, we'll come to that. So how many of us can even say that you know i've had such a lovely job where my boss is this way and you know people are in the streets have helped me it makes you feel that the world is such a nice place when you experience all this you know and how many of us have that experience that the world is such a nice place with so many nice people probably anandi with her the way her space that she lives in the kind of space that she where she connects with the higher and she's also intrinsically grateful for what she's got must be also creating that space where others uh, come in and become the best versions of themselves, you know. And to get in, uh, not only a family which is so beautiful, but to also get a uh, has a spouse and a spouse's family that is so beautiful is truly a gift. True. I'm sure you all agree. Yeah, I agree with you. I have been extremely lucky uh, because losing my sight was just one part of things. Okay, but what happened with me is, uh, you know, I no longer judge people by their looks. Okay, and that's such a gift. Uh, because when I talk to someone, when I uh, relate with someone, we are, I'm not looking at how posh or how rich or how beautiful or whatever. I'm looking at who they are. Okay? And that opens up beautiful relationships for me. Uh, because that I think the first level of judgment is gone. Very nice. And uh, I think um, Janaki Ramji was asking, where is the address of the shop? Yeah, so this is located in Kasturi Nagar on the second main road. If you know Kanti Suites, it's just opposite that. That'll be uh, near uh, along the uh, Banaswadi Road, is it? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Kasturi Nagar is near Banaswadi. It's uh, Kasturi Nagar, Kalyan Nagar, Sivi Ramanagar. They're all like in a line, you could say. Okay. Okay. So that addresses. Now I'm just throwing out the floor open to questions, but uh, um, I'm be uh, keeping a keen eye on the clock because it's nine sixteen now, seven sixteen, and um, you know Anandi also does have a meeting that she has to prepare for, so she have to you know go log off at seven twenty five. So would anybody have any questions for her at this point? We would like participation. It's, it'll be really nice for us to especially ask, you know, how, from your life's perspective, to become a stronger, better person through her experiences. Mm. 
not able to unmute. Okay, John, you did want to say something. Good evening, everyone. Could you please allow us to unmute alert? Any questions, anybody? So how many people okay. have been? Excuse me, sir. I have given an uh, option. I mean, I have given access to unmute. Okay, I believe now the access has been given. So Vivek ji, uh, could you please unmute? Oh, yeah, you can say something if you can unmute. Uh, yes. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, I am very inspired by uh, Anandi ji's uh, uh, life story. It's very, very inspiring. Uh, mm -hmm. Very uh, correct words uh, you had said, uh, Ramesh ji, that, you know, at the, the path could have been much difficult for us, um, for us, you know, uh, a normal person. Even for us, it's such a difficult uh, path to imagine the way Anandi could have taken this path. She mm -hmm. has, the way she has put it, she, the way she has carried uh, her life has, has been truly, you know, in a very blissful way. And and it's true yes. that she, it, it's gifted. Really? I've heard of so many people committing suicide when they lose, when they fail in their final exams or if they lose their job. Or if they have a loan, they can't pay back. And here she's lost her eyesight. She's lost her mother. And she just it sounds like a very, uh, you know, normal thing, the way she's overcome it. That, uh, you know, the, the, the sheer strength of even being able to normalize that is striking. Yes, it's 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 just blissful. I, I should say that if I had to uh, just listen to your story and uh, I, I could not just, let a second uh, away my go away myself because it was so interesting and so very uh, inspiring to listen and I congratulate you the way you have carried your life uh, and uh, very happy I'm uh, very happy and very all the best for your future and I would want to also ask Thank you. Uh, oh, what what is the most challenging thing you have seen you have come across uh, of all these of all the things. Uh, the most yeah. Yeah. and if that does a challenge <laughs> so of all of it the most challenging was to be a parent uh, because this was a new life and uh, this this child didn't know how to uh, cope with my difficulties so I had to I wanted to give her as much normal a childhood as she would have I did not want my disability to burden her so so it was very it was a challenge that I love and I love working with it that I try to do uh, you know to give her the same experience like every other child. So how did your child respond when she first discovered because initially it will, for her it will be completely normal but when she realizes that other other children's mothers have eyesight and you don't how did your child first take it? So uh, as you say, initially for a child, uh, for it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a very normal, uh, because they don't have the experience of the outer world. So whatever they see is true for them. Uh, or that's the only thing for them. They don't have uh, something to compare and check. Yes. Um, but now as she grows up and as she goes out, uh, so there are times when she gets bothered by it, uh, when she feels bad about it. Uh, but then we talk about it. We what we do, we have a lot of talking. And I I also tell her my feelings. You know, when I I tell her it's okay to feel sad about it. It's okay to feel hurt because that's a normal part of it. There's something that you want badly and you don't get, you know. We do feel bad about it. And I also feel bad about stuff. But then there are other things that I do which compensate. Sometimes it takes me away from my pain. It takes me so I talk to her to the level of her understanding. Uh, making her see what the other things that I do, I do better, you know, because I, you know, it doesn't, the, the sight doesn't play a part in most of the work that I do, because I've learned to compensate with other senses. So like, you know, when I'm telling her a story, I do voices, I do faces, I do action. So, so in a way, uh, she's, she understands that there are things that I won't be able to do. And there are things I do far better than others. And that I think balances it for her somewhere. That's very nice. So, um, would anybody else? I have um, one point. I have one yes. point, Ramesh. Hanji. Uh, Anandi Vishwanathan, uh, 
I don't know, really, it's very difficult to express the, our satisfaction in words. It was so very wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can uh, request you, yes, uh, from henceforth, if you have to do something differently, mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise us, uh, some few points, how we should live differently uh, from now on? Sir, so I would say, uh, I did not plan not to do anything differently. I was just... I, I just set to my heart on what I want to do. It is, I, I don't alert, I don't uh, check, evaluate on whether my seeing is required or not. I just think of what I want to do and then I see how I can do it. That's all. Oh, no, what I meant is, sorry, to clarify, see, we are living life in one pattern. Yes, sir. Uh, now, you have faced a lot of challenges and then we heard your story. So mm -hmm. if you summarize in few points, this is what it would help us in changing the kind of some of the, for example, faith or some uh, lifestyle changes or like meditation you mentioned, pranic healing. From mm -hmm. that, some few points which would be helpful as a take-home point. Take That's home. For all of us. For all yeah. of us. I don't know whether I made myself clear. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I place a lot of faith in my guru. Um, so that is my root and that is my uh, what I hold on to. Uh, so even when things are extremely difficult, uh, whether it's physically or emotionally. Uh, so I believe that uh, my guru covers me with, you know, I'm sheltered by my guru, by his, I, I, I think of it in a very physical sense, as if it were a it were a blanket that he was holding over me, protecting me, sheltering me, however you like to call it. Uh, and I would, I always think that if something is touching me, it is touching me through his blanket, through his cover, through him basically. So what is touching me is not the trouble, it is my guru who is touching me. So it is touching with his permission, which means he already knows what it is. So I place my faith in my guru that way entirely. So whatever happens, I know that it is that he's there, he's protecting. So I'm whatever I'm facing, it is not the hundred percent. I'm probably facing just a little bit, and the rest of it he is facing for me. So that's how I go through life. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, on that note, I'll have to close the question uh, question and answer a segment because we're just about run out of time. Time is um, 7.25 now, so um, we'll close shortly with the Loka Samasna, but to just summarize and uh, also a little bit of gratitude from our end at the School of Ancient Wisdom, which is what the vote of thanks is. Is uh, I'm, You know, I'm going through this program called um, uh, Abundance Program, and in that gratitude, I, I, I'm, I'm experiencing now on a daily basis is such a powerful thing to get things done. For example, I was trying to wait. I was waiting for the site plan sanction for my house to be for the past many months. It's supposed to have come in one and a half months, but with this gratitude that I'm expressing every day of it having already had come, has actually translated into reality, and I got the you know approval. The last few parts are, are remaining, but the attitude of gratitude is something that really stands out for uh, Anandiji's um, from the, her experience, and also you know the firm faith that is such a quiet, uh, you know, pillar of strength. She's got, she's got many pillars of strength. She's got a marvelous family. Uh, and most importantly, uh, from uh, there's a very pure soul here, if you've observed, of a person who has the right samskaras in the sense that she is connected to dharma. She's also intrinsically curious. She is a seeker by nature. That's what I have observed, which is why she's asked all those questions. And uh, with her... Basically, a very graceful and gracious person uh, as a personality. She's in uh, that invites all these wonderful gifts in life. The gift of having uh, nice people around her, uh, of course, nice job, lo a lovely father and brother, and the family being spiritually aware. That itself is a um, you know you've already crossed many uh, tests in life. You know when you have these kind of gifts, and quite clearly she seems to have achieved a certain level of personal growth in her previous life, where she's now able to take it forward. And sometimes uh, you know not being cluttered by excess, uh, like uh, you know having one less sense can actually be useful to also focus on the inner silence. <laughs> the eyes, eyes can give you a, an overload 
so many times, you know, with all the TV and uh, things that we have, YouTube and other things. In, in that sense, she's also blessed that she doesn't have to, uh, you know, be thrown into that kind of an overload. So I really see her in many ways as a gifted person. And um, I'm very grateful for what she shared because it, it has made me become a little more grateful for what I have and how to also connect better with, uh, you know, uh, how to have, be a little more surrender and to have faith in your Ishtadeva, in your Guru. It's such a personal thing. We have to make that personal connection. And that is really what she's exemplified today. You know, I must thank her for that. Thank you, Anand, uh, I think Anandi Ji. Yeah. was very, very nice to have, have you with us. Thank but, you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here. It's been beautiful for me to come. We have to, we have to thank Swati for that. So that's been a wonderful session today. We shall now um, bring it to a um, close. And what we do in School of Ancient Wisdom is um, we do the Loka Samastha. But this is a very special kind of Loka Samastha where we all come together as a family. We start remembering the loved ones in our lives uh, or other people in our community, our friends, colleagues, or other people who you want to pray for. You remember their illness or anything that you want the pray prayers to touch. And believe you me, it does work when you pray collectively. So um, please sit straight. Think of that person. And also, as the Loka Samastha said, we send out these positive vibrations to the world at large, to the inner world that connects all of uh, us as Atmas. And that really makes a difference and uplifts the consciousness. You never know where it can touch, which part of the world it can impact. The world needs this higher consciousness at the moment. Please sit straight, straight, with your back, neck, and head aligned. Take a nice deep breath. And let go. Center yourself within. As you send your Sankalpa out. <clears throat> Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat Brahmar Panamastu Let the sound of silence permeate in our lives. Bless and guide us in every way. Silence of silence is the language of the soul. On that note, thank you everyone. God bless you. And let's meet again next Thursday. Please do bring your friends and loved ones. For another beautiful session of inspiring wisdom. Channel your honesty has left the meeting alert. Thank you, Anitiji. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Swati.